right, this is John Cola with GrowingYourGreens.com to do another exciting episode for you. Uh, today we're going to do another Q&A for you and I'm going to answer your guys' questions. I have over a million different subscribers on my different YouTube channels. So if you do have a question for me, the only way that I may answer it is in a Q&A session like this. If you want to ask me a question, I'll post a link down below to my community tab. Uh, and you can post your question there. Anyways, on with this month's questions. First question is from Big Hemp in 8603. Hey John, love the channel. I was wondering if TD has his own grow channel. Also, how can I get in touch with him to ask him a few cannabis related questions? I need answers, thanks in advance. All right, Big Hemp. So what I'm gonna say is that TD unfortunately does not have his own YouTube channel. Um, he's actually not even on YouTube. I don't even think he's on any social medias because he's just kind of like doing his own thing behind the scenes, right? So I don't think he really wants to be out in the public. That being said, I would say if you do have any Canvas Grow questions, you want to talk to Josh at Boogie Brew. You know, TD uses basically all of Josh's products to grow his cannabis. And, you know, Josh pretty much knows all TD's practices. So I'm sure that Josh could probably likely answer any questions that you may have. Uh, for TD. Next question is from a Bayer HI1234. Do you ever do tours or classes? And the answer is a long time ago I used to do kind of in-person classes with a tour but lately you know this is basically my home so it's not set up to do classes or tours. I may do classes in the future at different locations but not my personal home base location. And you know, for tours, I do give you guys video tours every season, summer and winter, um, where I show you guys everything I'm growing. All right. Next question from a uh, Miss Des eighty seven seven five. What vegetables slash fruits can quote really be grown indoors by grow light or good natural light window for its entire lifespan? All right, so that is a good question. So it depends who you ask. You're asking an outside gardener who believes in the sun and the power of real sunlight, right? Grow lights, even the best grow lights cannot duplicate all the different UV spectrums, especially during the time of day or time of year that the sun can provide. So in my personal opinion, you know, some, growing something indoors is never going to be as good as it could be outdoors. Now, can you get some very good, high-quality products growing things indoors? Absolutely. So what I'll tell you is this. I'm going to tell you that if something needs to fruit and you're growing it indoors, you know, it's more unlikely that you're going to be successful or grow something high-quality. So I'm going to say if you want to grow something indoors, the best thing to grow indoors for sure is sprouts and microgreens when they're little babies. You know, those are super simple and can be grown their whole lifespan, which is actually quite short. In the case of sprouts, a few days. In the case of microgreens, could be like two weeks, and boom, you're done. You're harvesting them, and that's their whole lifespan, and you're eating them, right? After that, if you did want to grow something indoors, you know, in a window cell, I would then say grow something like herbs. Herbs, you know, some of them are less demanding, and while they may not have as much polyphenols because they're not being stressed out by the UV and, the, and the, the sun because it's being from a window or it's not getting any UV because it's in like grow lights, right? Um, plants react differently when they're stressed out and then can create more beneficial plant compounds, phytochemicals, because they, they create them to protect themselves from the stressors, from the weather, from bugs eating them. I mean, I'm gonna, I can show you. I have some, you know, my, my mustard greens have holes in it right here, right? That's a good thing. When my mustard greens get holes, that means like the bugs are eating my mustard greens. The bugs are then breaking open cells in the mustard greens and then release the enzyme, which then creates more nutrition in the mustard greens when I finally eat them, right? <laughs> and if you're indoors, you don't have any pests, right? That's never going to happen. So, you know, I'm not going to say indoor grown food is subpar or not as good. But what I will say is that, hey, growing your own food is always better than buying it from somewhere else. But it's best to grow outdoors. That being said, grow herbs or grow leafy greens indoors. And I'd prefer to grow herbs or leafy greens that have a fast, quick turn, um, you know, or herbs that, you know, you just keep around year round. I mean, you could also get like something like an arrow garden and, and grow those. I mean, th those grow great looking crops. You know, I would definitely question the nutrients in there because they are using growing more hydroponically 
and you know I don't want to get into a big argument hydroponic versus soil grown because clearly my views are that the soil grown in minerals in good compost with the sun I mean that's how nature made things so I think that's best honestly next question is from Sue 3702 I'm in zone 10 made the mistake of lining my raised beds with cardboard underneath the cardboard is sand and rocks in the in the extreme heat of Arizona the cardboard disintegrated in less than a year also I have grub worms in some of my beds do I use neem oil and keep planting or dig out all the beds and start over with weed screen and sterilize the soil to get rid of the grub worms PS I'm not planning on buying new soil for all my raised beds all right Sue. So, so I was gonna share my commentary as a gardener growing in also a desert and climate where I also have had grub worms in my garden beds and where I do have videos showing to line the bottom of your beds with cardboard. All right, so number one, I don't know that I'd call it a mistake to line the bottom of your raised beds with cardboard. You know, I think that could be a good thing because, you know, normally you line the bottom of the raised beds with cardboard to suffocate out the weeds and things that are growing underneath it so they don't get into your bed. Actually, that happened in one of my raised beds that I did not put cardboard and I got this stupid like spreader grass stuff it's a pain so and then cardboard is designed to rot out it's not designed to sit there and be cardboard forever right you're you're it's rotting out earthworms are eating it bacteria is decaying it and is actually creating more organic matter and feeding your soil a carbonaceous material which i believe to be a good thing you know if you wanted bottoms on your raised bed so no nothing could get in there from the bottom you could have put wood on there but then guess what that would have ended up rotting and I don't recommend necessarily closing off the bottom of your raised bed and then you say uh, let's see if you have grub worms in your bed so like the question is are the grub worms bad you know and is it bad because they're unsightly and there's these little ball you know things in there that look weird and they're gonna be beetles when they grow up and I mean, are they really going to damage your garden? Do you know this? I mean, I mean, what I'll tell you is this. Like, I, I mean, if you dig random spots in my garden, you may get a couple grub worms, right? Am I doing anything to treat them? No, <laughs> I'm not doing anything. Like, does my garden still grow? Yes. Like, now, if I, if I plant a whole bed of something and then everything disappears or everything doesn't grow good, then I'm going to take some action. But, you know, here's the thing. I mean, unfortunately, on the earth, we have a very human centric idea of the earth like we are the humans and with space aliens came they're the aliens and we're the humans and we're the earthlings but really there's a really good movie called the earthlings where the grub worms are actually earthlings because they also live here you know flies and ants they also live here as well so you know if the grub worms look unsightly and you don't like them that's one thing you know the question the other question is how are they affecting your garden you know and so I would say that, you know, you want to observe nature and see, are they really affecting your garden or just you just don't like them being in your garden, right? You cannot control the elements. You cannot control nature, right? If you have good garden soil and there just happens to be beetles that lay their eggs and the grub worms are in your garden and, you know, hey, that's just part of nature, right? Some beetles in your garden could be a good thing because now they're breaking down organic matter and pooping in your garden and stuff. But if, hey, the grub worms are starting to eat all your roots in that one bed and cause a problem, then I would take swift and immediate action. Neem oil would not be something I would use in standard industry. They would use neonicotinoids because neonicotinoids, which I highly recommend against and do not advocate for, are systemic. What that means is they get into every plant cell, they get into the roots, and then when the, you know, the bugs eat any part of the plant, leaves or roots or anything, you know, it's going to get the neonicotinoids and it's going to mess them up, right? That being said, neonicotinoids can be in a lot of different food products. And actually, I reviewed conventional food grown, imported, and also domestic. And one of the big compounding pesticides that are used in commercial crops, conventional crops, are, number one or two, was neonicotinoids. So if you're just buying conventional food, you're probably eating low levels of neonicotinoids which are also killing the bees, which I don't recommend. So yeah, I'm, a little, I'm on a little bit of a soapbox. So don't use neonicotinoids, whatever you do. <laughs> and I don't, do not recommend you even eat them in your own you know, diet, and that's why I encourage you guys to eat organic. Nonetheless, what are some natural alternatives to neonicotinoids? 
So they have a couple things. Number one, this thing called milky spore, which is basically the kind of bacteria that some grub worms will eat and then it'll just basically pop their bellies open or something. It's like BT for, you know, like horn worms and for other kind of, you know, caterpillar things, crawly things. So it's the milky spore you could add to your soil. Now the other thing, there are beneficial nematodes that could also get in your soil and also take care of your grub worm problem. Um, so yeah, that being said, do you need to do those things? You know, once again, I would just kind of like pay attention to your garden and see what's going on. I mean, the grub worms could be in there like the grub worms are in a lot of my raised beds. I don't think there's very high populations, but they're definitely in there because I'll be digging every once in a while and I'll find one and then, you know, I'll do what I may with it. But for the most part, I don't try to go out of my way to kill them or add different kind of, you know, milky spore. I don't try to add different kinds of beneficial nematodes to take care of them because they're just part of nature and they want to live too, all right? That's my opinion. All right, next question is from a TT911. Exists such as no watering, no digging, lazy garden. <laughs> all right, so that's a good question. So what I'm going to say is this, like if we look at it, nature, right? Nature is God's garden, Earth's garden, right? In nature, there's no watering, no digging, Right? And we all these things grow without us, right? So I'd say if you guys want to have a no-dig, no-water garden, depending on where you live, right, you want to look at the native crops that live near you. I live in the desert. We have cactuses that live out in the desert, right? I could go up hiking and there's you know drought-tolerant edible plants like Mormon tea that grow in the desert with just the natural rainfall without digging, without anybody planting a lot of these things there, right? So what you want to do if you guys want to have a no digging, no irrigation garden is find all the local crops near you and then research which ones are edible and then bring those crops into your space and grow them, right? They're going to take very little maintenance. Also, the other thing is grow weeds, you know, <laughs> no, not weed, grow weeds. I have a video with Katrina, Katrina Blair, link down below to that where there, you know, if you have disturbed soil, weeds grow out of the cracks in New York City, weeds grow up, even if you didn't plant them in the, in the wild without, depending on the time of year, of course, you know, without any intervention. So there are absolutely ways you guys could have a garden without digging or irrigation. You just want to bring in the plants or even you could even bring in seeds or even cuttings of some of these plants to grow on your property that then you maintain and now can have more wild foods that would be growing naturally near you and of course depending on where you live you may have a lot of edibles you could grow or less all right next question is from uh, linda crockett 2863 how can i get rid of thousands of ants on my property and i'm gonna say call an exterminator because i ain't one <laughs> all right all right so seriously though what i'm gonna tell you is that you know ants could be a good or bad thing you know um, ants could help pollinate and can help spread pollen and seeds and all these other things on your property and actually be beneficial. You know, it's quite unfortunate that once again, we, as I talked about earlier, we have a human centric focus in our lives and we focus on us and that if it's not us and it's not what we want on our property, like a vegetable garden, if there's ants invading our vegetable garden, then it's automatically bad. I think that we need to take a step back and look at it in context. Hey, if the ants aren't harming you, right, if the ants are doing their thing, right, they could be benefiting your garden by helping you with pollination, help aerating the soil, you know. Of course, if they're like, you know, dis destroying things, right, like termites, they destroy, you know, your, your house and all these things, then that's not a good thing. But we should kind of step back and take a look at nature. Hey, what are these ants doing? Are they really harming me? Hey, if they're fire ants, and every time you go out in your backyard, you step down and then they start biting you and hurting you or hurting your children or pets. I absolutely say, take them out, right? But if they're just like, you know, sugar ants and they're not really hurting anything, then they're, you know, I wouldn't really bother with them, you know? What I will say is that sometimes ants can spread disease and or pests. So ants could farm aphids, you know, I see that happen sometimes of the year. And then when that happens, then I definitely get more aggressive with dealing with the ants. You know, you could get some kind of citrus oil, um, you know, to spray on, do instant contact kill on ants. You can 
suck ants up with a vacuum cleaner. You know, you could get different kinds of uh, diatomaceous earth to hopefully repel them. But watch out when you use that to make sure you want to have a mask on because that can hurt you actually. But you know, overall, I recommend simple bait traps. Bait traps with sugar and boric acid. You know, the simple brand is the Taro brand. It's the liquid that's like clear. You could make your own. I have an ant trap that I actually put out last season. Filled it up with like liquid ant bait to try to get the ants go there. I would actually just get the ant bait and put in like little bottle caps of bottled water and just fill the bait up with that and put it in various areas of my garden where I would see ant trails so that they could go to that and then surely within a week or two sometimes I'd see no more ants for a little bit until they would come back. So you know I would say that you know let them live unless they're really affecting you negatively of course you don't want to get them out of control either because the more they're happy the more they will just overpopulate until they can get to be a chronic situation so I mean I could see some ants crawling on the ground right there I'm not out here trying to kill them I'm like okay they're doing their thing but once they start affecting me in a negative way and you know they're, they're getting out of control that's when I'm gonna step in and you know take some action all right next question is from organic clean food connection is there a brand somebody suggests for the mycorrhizae yes yeah, so I recommend actually the plant success brand mycorrhizae i've been using the, those guys for like almost since i started my youtube channel many years ago um, i like them a lot and the reason why i like them a few reasons number one is that they include several different kinds of mycorrhizae not just mycorrhizae also beneficial bacteria as well and you know the the one i use is in the shaker and i just shake a little bit on each roots and i find that works really well of course they also have one that's soluble you could just mix up with water and then spray on or dip in your roots uh, to the plants um, before you plant them as well. All right, next question from a uh, T Jackson, 1953. Hi John, do you still recommend the soil place in Texas, or is there another place? And what was its name? Thank you. Yeah, so I haven't been to Nature's Way Resource. I think it's in Conroe, Texas. Link down below to that video. You know, it is extremely rare for me to go to a soil yard and find that actually they make fungal soil. I'm sure Nature Way Resources is still making their fungal soil and paying attention to their soil. You know, this is light years ahead of what most soil yards do because they just make bacterial compost, which is a dime a dozen. You know, Nature's Way Resources specifically will make leaf mold compost. They'll make a, you know, a fungal dominated compost and every different kind of compost in between. So I'd recommend getting out there if you're able and you live in the area. Um, that being said, if you're not able to do that, then I recommend, you know, making your own wood chip pile and letting it degrade over a couple, three years. Don't add any nitrogen to it. It'll slowly degrade. You could add, you know, different kinds of fungi to it to help it degrade a little bit faster and make a fungal dominated soil. Of course, I also recommend you guys collecting your leaves, like I, I was it a, the guy up in Canada that collected leaves and he mulched his garden with leaves every winter, like a couple feet high. And then by the spring, they would basically collapse down and then con convert into a really nice compost. So, you know, making your own compost is always better than buying some. Of course, when you're starting your garden, you may need to bring in some compost, like all the soil you see behind me that's raised up was all brought in because I, I didn't want to deal with the the native soil, which is actually has very little organic matter in it. So yeah, Nature's Way Resource, and I was glad to see that there's a few places online that I'll ship Nature's Way Resource products to you. That being said, the shipping is very expensive, so I'd recommend highly against it. That being said, I do recommend buying worm castings, another good uh, fungal source of uh, the microbes for your garden if you are not able to get the Nature's Way Resource. All right. Next question is from a DBM Salsi. I'm looking all over for what would be some good options for store-bought compost to make compost tea with. I was looking at the Epsoma Organic Land and Sea Gourmet Compost. Would this be a good choice? What else would be good or better? I'm not looking for any pre-made compost tea in a bag either. So of course, you know, I don't make my own compost tea I buy the Boogie Brew compost tea brand, which is what I would recommend to you. Like, why go out and do it yourself if you could have some high-quality compost tea where Josh has sourced all the ingredients and then put them together in the proper amounts for you. Link down below, boogiebrew.net slash GYG to get my special Boogie Brew um, GYG hookup prices. 
That being said, if you guys do want to make yourself, then I would recommend at least minimally following Josh's open source compost tea recipe. Link down below to that where I basically visit him and we go over all the different ingredients he uses in his, in his compost tea so that you could learn the variety of ingredients and the percentages that he uses to make one of the best world-class compost teas out there. Of course, if you guys don't want to use his exact recipe, then check the link down below where I interview Josh and we go over a workhorse tea recipe, which is basically just give you guys some of the basic, you know, ingredients you need to make a compost tea with. One of which for me, the most important for me is actually not compost, but it's earthworm castings. So before I even bought any kind of Epsoma organic linen sea gourmet compost, which I have no idea what it is, I'd buy worm castings because at least worm castings um, you know, are more broken down and have a lot of organic and biologic activity more so than, any, than, than most composts that are made. Unfortunately, most composts that are sold near you are basically made by big soil yards where they just get a lot of, basically I would call them throwaway inputs that are diverted from the landfill and then compost them, including forest products and whatnot. And then they compost and maybe add a few extra things and then sell it to you in a bag. It's all bacterial based compost. And in my opinion, it's not very high quality, usually pretty woody. I mean, if you did want to use some kind of compost in a bag, I would say try to find a local compost facility or soil yard or find another gardener or worm farmer near you and see if you could buy some of the compost from them, check a local community garden, right? I'd say those are far better sources than getting some kind of bagged product coming from some regional facility where, you know, hey, it's not necessarily meant for compost tea. And if you're gonna have to make, if you're gonna have to take the time to make compost tea, guys, do it right, because I want you guys to have good results. I don't want you guys just to use any old compost and then say, oh, my compost tea didn't work right. Well. That's because if you're not using good source ingredients, you're not going to have a good compost tea. So, I mean, that's why I don't want to screw around with trying to find the best ingredients. I let Josh do all the sourcing for me. In many cases, I'll recommend sources to him to use <laughs> that he will get. And then, uh, you know, he'll add all those together and then I just get to use this compost tea. So just make life a lot simpler <laughs> instead of DIY. But if you want to DIY, once again, links down below to the two videos I recommend. All right, next question is from uh, Jenny Animal 9046. Am I making a mistake by growing trees from the seeds I get from the stores? Because I've got tons of trees and you know, they're about two, three years old now. All right, Jenny, so what do you mean you're getting seeds you get from the store? Does that mean you're buying like apples? You eat the apples and then you take out the seeds and then you plant the seeds? or you're buying oranges or plums or apricots and you're planting the seeds. Hey, I think planting your own seeds are great. That being said, when you buy fruits and eat the fruit and then plant the seed, you may not get the exact same apple or fruit that you planted. So for example, if you plant Fuji apple seeds on a Fuji apple you ate, you plant the Fuji apple seed in the ground and then the tree grows, right? And then you get an apple on it, it could be like, tastes really sour and a crab apple and not even be sweet, right? Because here's the thing, not all seeds are true to seed. So that means that if you eat a Fuji apple, you plant it seed, you're not going to get a Fuji apple identical. You're going to get some other kind of apple because, you know, the, it's like if you had a baby with somebody, the baby's not going to look like you or your partner. It's going to look like a mix between you and your partner. And same thing with many different fruit trees, right? That being said, you may get a variety, small chance, that is gonna be better than the one you ate. Or you're gonna invent a new variety, which is really cool. That being said, sometimes it's gonna be small, it's not gonna taste good, and in some cases, the fruit tree may not even ever produce for you. So, you know, that's when you gotta ask yourself, how much space do I have, and what are my goals? Hey, if your goal is to experiment and come up with a new variety that you could name, right? Name it after your husband, your child, <laughs> you know, or even yourself, right? That's great, then do it. It's fun, man, I love creating new varieties and letting my plants get promiscuous in my garden and create seeds. I mostly do this with vegetables. And then I have new different crossbreeds of tree collards, for example, and that could be wonderful, right? But if you're expecting to live off the fruit you're growing, right, then I would say, hey, it's probably worthwhile to invest in some proper trees. That being said, once you have the tree growing, and the root stock coming up, you could use the roots and then you could basically cut it in an apple and then you could get what's called scion wood or gets cutting from a Fuji apple tree and then basically um, graft it on or you know like 
I will say glue it on. <laughs> That's not exactly right, but glue it on. And now basically the roots from the seedling you had will be the bottom and the top will be, you know, from the scion wood or from the wood of an apple tree. And then they'll basically meld together. So it's like if you lost your arm and you had a sister and your sister cut off her arm and the doctors surgically put it on your arm and now you have your sister's arm, but you're still you, right? I don't know. That's, that's how I explain it. I'm not a freaking botanist. So, uh, so that could be really cool too. So, you know, right now, like a lot of the tropical fruit seeds that I'm saving are going to be good only for the seedling, right? And for the rootstock, right? It may not grow into the same style tree, but you know, something like the Anonas family, like Rolinia, Rolinia will grow true to seed, whereas something like Mamesa Pote won't. That being said, if you do want to graft these things, I've learned from the gra a grafting expert to do it when, when the trees are young. Uh, they're pushing out more growth auxins and growth material, and you'll likely be more successful at that point. You know, so you could use those for grafting, or, you know, you could buy some trees, and I'd say, how much space do you have? If you have, like, you know, 100 acres, plant all the seedlings you can to see what the heck happens, right? But if you need to eat and you have a one acre, man, you should probably buy some fruit trees or actually minimally, you know, graft the trees so you're going to get cultivars or varieties that are edible and going to be productive for you. All right, we're down to the last question today, which is from uh, Claudio Santana, 3320. Hi, John. I'd like to taste and eat papaya seeds with the fruit. Does anybody else feel the same? Yeah, so papaya seeds are edible. Yes, they are. They have a kind of like peppery style flavor. I like to eat some papaya seeds every now and then. Uh, that being said, if you're a woman trying to get pregnant, I recommend not eating the papaya seeds. There are naturally occurring toxins in the papaya seeds that can cause abortions, it is said. Um, that being said, I also encourage people not to eat, go out of their way to eat excessive amounts of papaya seeds or any other seeds for that matter. So, for example, apples have cyanide. Apricot seeds also have the cyanide, which in small amounts can be a beneficial thing, but in large amounts can be deadly. So, you know, I haven't researched papaya seeds in general to know that, you know, hey, how, what's the dosage to make it actually toxic to you versus the dosage that actually can help you, you know, deworm or not have parasites, right? So there's always a balance and I don't want you guys to be, oh, they're so good, I'm going to eat a lot of them and eat too many of them. And, you know, and then, of course, most people throw out all their papaya seeds. So generally when I eat papaya, I may try to eat like one mouthful of seeds when I'm eating them, of course, some people also will dehydrate papaya seeds and then grind them up and use them as pepper as a flavoring agent when they cook their food or even in salads and whatnot. You know, but then once again, you're not eating large quantities. So yeah, I think the dose is in the poison in many cases. And so I would say for those of you guys that haven't tried eating papaya seeds, hey, I would encourage you to try it. <laughs> and for those of you guys that are eating them, I would caution you about eating too many. So yeah, that's my personal take on it. Of course, you got to do what feels right for you. So anyways, that's it for this month's Q&A. If you guys enjoyed this month's Q&A, hey, please be sure to give this video a big thumbs up. More importantly, be sure to share this video with other gardeners you feel it could help. That's much appreciated. That'll help uh, make this video rank higher in the YouTube algorithm. Also, be sure to click that subscribe button right down below so you don't miss my new and upcoming episodes. I've coming out every five to seven days. You never know where to show up or what you'll be learning on my YouTube channel. Make sure you click the little bell so you get notified as many videos come out. And finally, be sure to check out past episodes. The past episodes are a wealth of knowledge. Over 1,700 episodes at this time on the channel dedicated to teach you guys how to grow your own food at home. So with that, my name is John Kohler with GrowingYourGreens.com. We'll see you next time. And until then, remember, keep on growing.